everybody. It's time for us to get started tonight. So if we uh, would be opening our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, if you have your study material with you, I hope that you do, uh, you can be opening to our current week's lesson, which is found on uh, page 9. It has to do with uh, the report of the visions, which is chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. And so uh, while you're turning there, I'll uh, just uh, offer a welcome to everybody who's here with us tonight to study the book of 1 Corinthians for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're grateful that everybody has made the decision to be here tonight. Uh, you're our honored guest, and we're thankful that we can come together and study God's Word uh, one with another. Uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of do a brief review of some of the things that we've talked about in the past couple of weeks to jog our memories. Uh, who's the author of 1 Corinthians? Paul. Paul, very good. How about the date and place of writing? How about the place of writing? Do you remember where it was written? Yeah. Ephesus. Okay, good. Uh, probably on the third missionary journey uh, around 55 AD, give or take. Uh, a couple of years, depending on what uh, chronological method you're looking at. So that's uh, the date and place. How about the audience? To whom is Paul writing? The Corinthian church. The Corinthian church. To the Corinthian church, right? Is this his first letter ever to the Corinthian church? No. He, uh, he mentions in this very letter that he had written them a letter before. So it's technically the second letter to the Corinthians, even though we call it 1 Corinthians. Uh, so uh, it was to Corinth. What are some distinct features about the city of Corinth and the people of Corinth that we need to be aware of as we approach this text? Location, uh, large city, uh, fourth largest in the Roman Empire, was the capital of Greece during this time. Uh, kind of a hodgepodge of people, as Miss Linda mentioned. You had a lot of uh, pagan idol worship, but you also had a Jewish population there. A lot of slaves. A lot of slavery. Over half the population were slaves uh, in the city of Corinth. So, uh, what are some of the things that these individuals value? What are some of their values that we talked about? Are they competitive people? Very competitive uh, spirit, uh, to the point of fault. Uh, not just friendly competition, we're talking about kind of cutthroat competition. And the goal was they, they were very, uh, very addicted to status. Uh, it was more important about what you looked like in terms of status to other people than it was what you actually believed and what you actually were. And so these people clamored for status. They were people who were very uh, competitive, very worldly minded, generally, in the city of Corinth. So it's important that we remember that as we approach this text because these are real people set in a real setting in history. And the better we can understand the audience to which Paul is writing, it helps us to understand uh, some of the things he has to say in this book. And so, written to the Church of Corinth, what's the overall purpose of this letter? Correct. I heard to correct. What else? Well, if everybody said correct, that's fine. I just thought there maybe there's more than one answer. <laughs> Basically, to correct the sins that existed in the church, uh, a series of problems uh, that they were having. And so that's primarily the reason for writing, as we're going to see here, and especially in our text tonight, when Paul uh, goes from kind of introducing the text, uh, giving thanks for them, greeting them, he moves very quickly to the corrective part uh, of his letter. How about the key chapters that we talked about? They're in the teens. 13. 13. 13. Chapter 13. Why is chapter 13 important? I see a lot of mouth moving, but I can't hear your voice. If anybody. the best exposition about love. In the love. Context. Yep, love. Good. Love. And that's really the crescendo of what Paul's trying to teach them. All these things that they were going through, all these horrible problems they had in the church, 
could be corrected if they were properly practicing the agape love that he describes in chapter 13. Now, how about the, another chapter that's very prominent in this, in this book? Very good. 15, because chapter 15 talks about what? Resurrection. The resurrection. The centrality of the resurrection to the Christian message and the inseparability from, uh, of the resurrection from the Christian's hope and his own or her own resurrection. Apparently there were many people there that uh, did not believe in the resurrection or were being influenced to believe that. All right, now just some things specifically about our lesson last week. Uh, we talked about the importance of not allowing the world to influence the church. We talked about how the church is set, the whole purpose of the church is to be a distinct group of people in the world, uh, or to be a light to the world, the salt of the earth. But the problem in Corinth was that the world was influencing more, them more than they were influencing the world. And you couldn't distinguish uh, who was a Christian and who was of the world because so much of the world had influenced those who were in the body of Christ. And so we, we discussed that at some length last time. Uh, we talked about the fact uh, that at the second coming, those who are faithful are going to be found blameless, without blame. Nobody can say you're condemned if you're in Christ because of what Christ does for us, because of the justification that's in him. But we also talked about that that's not unconditional. Once we're saved, it's not always saved because uh, in, in many passages, we looked at, especially in a passage in Colossians, it talked about if you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, you'll be found blameless at the last day in Christ. And we also talked about the, the notion that God is faithful, that we can trust in his promises, we can trust in his nature, we can trust his word, that he will bring uh, to pass his promises. And so those are some of the things we've talked about in the past few weeks. But now if we turn our attention to, uh, if you would kind of, uh, now focus our attention on verses 10 through 17. I hope that everybody's uh, spent some time in this text. Uh, only eight verses. Uh, certainly we could read these multiple times in the course of a week. Uh, and I hope that you've uh, read the material that I've printed up and also attempted to answer the questions and are prepared to discuss those things tonight. But here in this text, Paul moves to the corrective tone that he sets forth uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. And he introduces the first main problem. Uh, that the church was having, and that was what? Division. division. Schismata in the Greek. Schism. Schism. They had divisions in the body of Christ. That was the main problem. And so that's the, the main issue that he will be addressing in verses 10 through 17. And so uh, to, let's go ahead, and as our custom is in this class, I like to read the whole text. Everybody just kind of focus in together, get a, get a whole picture of the text at one time. I believe we started in the back last time. Uh, we're go we'll go back to the front this time. Uh, we'll just kind of go in a zigzag fashion, and we'll just read one verse per person. Uh, if you would not like to read, that's fine. Just say pass, and the next person uh, can read the next verse. And so let's just read these eight verses together, and we'll begin with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. We'll start with Mr. Terrell. We'll move our way this way, and uh, uh, we'll see who we finish up with. So, Mr. Terrell, if you would start us off. And also... Uh, I am recording these sessions, and it's, it's sometimes in the class it's difficult uh, for the comments to be heard. Uh, you can hear me pretty good because I'm right here, but uh, if you could, when you read or if you make a comment, try to speak up a little bit so we can make sure the audio gets captured because we do have people that follow us online, and we want to make sure that they can hear the comments that are being made. And so I'll, if you see me point this out, I'm not trying to you know, point a laser on your forehead. I'm just trying to make sure we can capture the audio. Yes, sir. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. What are some things that jump out to you in that passage that indicate how we can cultivate a culture in the church that is of the same mind that Paul is pleading for and lifting to also in 1 Corinthians? We have to <clears throat> recognize that selfish ambition is a sin and it has no place. And uh, to be able to speak the same thing and have the same mind does not require an individual to agree with another individual on every point. Now, I have to put a footnote with that and say we're, we're talking about agreement in the faith. There's only one faith. So I'm not saying that we don't agree on points of faith. But there have been people that I've encountered in life that had the attitude that you had to agree with them about everything which went beyond faith. And so that's selfish ambition. Sure. And we'll talk more about kind of you know what we need to be like-minded. Uh, what's the what's the uh, I guess the where's the line? What do we have to be like-minded? And I think we'll save some of that for the discussion period. But what about this text? What what about this text right here? What do we learn about the mind we're to have and how it is that we can accomplish having the same mind? Who's brought up? We need to look at the uh, interests of all, not just yourself. Okay, exactly. Looking to the interests of others. So uh, what does that require first? Love, fellowship, and mercy. Love, fellowship, and mercy. And I have to, I have to humble myself, right? Mm -hmm. I'm only concerned about the things that I want to do. And, and my, only, my personal interests, it's hard for me to look into the things of others. That's why he says here, in lowliness of mind, humbleness, lowering oneself in their mind. Uh, looking to the things of others. Who's brought up as an example? Christ. Christ. You want to know how to have unity and be of the same mind in the church? You look at the Lord. That's right. Remember we talked about if those who were here uh, in our in the sermon, I guess not this past week, but the week before on Psalm 23. We talked about how a shepherd with the sheep, oftentimes the sheep quarrel amongst themselves. They have a sort of a, a, a little budding order similar to a pecking order and some other uh, you know, breeds of animals. And they can't rest. They can't sleep unless they have that peace of mind within, uh, within themselves. The thing that makes them forget about their differences, not forget about them, but it alleviates that pressure, is when the shepherd comes into the room. They all look at the shepherd and they, they, whatever was going on between them disappears. And so that's a similar idea. I think when we realize, we get our eyes fixated on being like the Savior, I think that's going to eliminate a lot of the, the disunity uh, that we experience in the brotherhood, and certainly that'd be true for the church of Corinth. And so, uh, having the same having the same mind, we need to look to the Lord how He humbled Himself, because so much of what we're divided over comes down to attitude problems. It really does. And uh, you know, we're, I was talking to Mr. Bill and the, the men on Saturday morning about you know how many uh, we just brought up this question: how many uh, churches of the Lord's people? How many congregations of the Lord's people? Of those that have divided and split, what percentage of those have been over legitimate doctrinal reasons versus interpersonal opinions, things that really don't matter that much? Much smaller. Exactly. The, the vast majority of reasons for people splitting apart seem to be kind of interpersonal conflicts, and a lot of that is what we're talking about tonight, uh, these things that can be alleviated when we try to become like the Lord, think about what he did. And so that, that's kind of what's under consideration at this point. So... He, he commands them to have the same mind. Uh, the Christian mindset that distinguishes good and right from evil and wrong. We start to love the things that God loves, and if we're doing that, we're all following the same book, we should all be moving in the same direction. We're all trying to be transformed into the image of Christ. And so we should be coming more and more like each other if we're all growing, if you think about it. And that reduces the friction, okay? And to be of the same mind and the same judgment. That term judgment uh, has reference to unity of purpose. Uh, or agreement based on knowledge, the same goals and opinions about the truth, the same beliefs about what the truth is, uh, the, the matters of faith, which I uh, mentioned earlier. Okay, so that's verse 10. How about verse 11? For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. 
So Paul is giving away his source here. here here's his informant, the household of Chloe. And uh, we don't know much about this individual. Uh, it's possible that it's likely that she was a Christian. Uh, but we just know that those of the household are the ones that informed Paul of the contentions. Now that term contentions here uh, really should be translated something like strife. I guess they mean a similar thing. But most times that this, Greek, uh, this Greek term is translated in the uh in the English, it's translated to strife. And so it means to strike, argue, quarrel, uh, conflict resulting from rivalry and discord is the idea here. This is, uh, some have said this, always saying bad things about one another, never having a good word to say about one another. This is sort of a, a, hot, uh, a hot dispute between people. And we all know people that don't ever seem to have anything positive to say who always want to run other people down. And that's not conducive to the type of unity we're reading about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the type of unity uh, that the Lord expects of us. That's what he's saying here. He's saying you have these contentions among you because of selfish ambition, because people are running other people down. And that attitude, that, that, that type of mindset can exist in a Christian. It can't. That needs to be something that we grow out of because those contentions are absolutely wrong. Uh, contrast this with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, 19. What this does not mean is that there's never a time to stand upon the truth and there, that there are legitimate reasons for <coughs> religious groups to break away from each other. Uh, in this same book, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 11, 19, notice what it says here. So, in the First Corinthians 1, we're talking about sort of personality uh, rivals and dis uh, discord on that basis. But in First Corinthians 11, 19, Paul says this. He says, For there must also be factions among you, that they that are approved may be manifest among you. Paul seems to be saying here that there's going to be divisions that come for legitimate reasons. And part of that can have a leavening process on the body of Christ. Within a congregation, there might be a group of people who are teaching something wrong and who refuse to give it up. And that division may come to approve those, uh, to make manifest or make known those who are approved. That's what this text is indicating. So that's not exactly what we're talking about back in chapter 1, but that's a contrast. There is a time when we do need to break ties for certain reasons, but those are matters of faith, and that's a different category. We're talking about interpersonal relationships in chapter 1. So he's talking about these contentions. All right, how about verse uh, 12? It says, it says, Now this I say that every one of you that says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. And so here, it's probably the case that you have certain of those of the Corinthian church that were following, the uh, sort of setting up political parties in a sense, rallying around leaders in that church. Paul of course, planted the church there, so he was a very prominent figure. You had Apollos, who also was very instrumental in the, uh, the early stages of that church. In fact, let's just look very quickly at, at, at Acts chapter 18. Uh, at the end of Acts chapter 18, of course, Acts chapter 18 is the chapter that tells us about the foundation or the uh, planting of the Corinthian church, but in the latter part of chapter 18, it talks about... Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, teaching a man by the name of Apollos. And we learn a few things about Apollos at the end of chapter 18. Look at 18.27. Well, first of all, let's, uh, let's go up a few verses. Look at verse 24. Acts 18.24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by race, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus. And he was mighty in the scriptures. This man has been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, knowing only the baptism of John. And so uh, he is speaking boldly in the synagogue. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, take him to the side and teach him the way of God more perfectly. And after that, he sent to Corinth. At the end of chapter, in verse 27, it says that when he was minded to pass over into Achaia, the brethren encouraged him. And wrote to the disciples to receive him. And when he was come, notice, he helped them much. He's talking about the Corinthians. He helped them much that had believed through grace. For he powerfully confuted the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And so Apollos came to the Corinthian church after Paul had left. And he was uh, very instrumental in encouraging those brethren. He was standing up 
reasoning from the scriptures to the, to the Jews in the synagogue in Corinth. And uh, he apparently was a very eloquent man. He was somebody who was an Alexandrian, who was very highly educated. Alexandria was uh, the, the seat of the great library back in that time. And so here was a great orator that the Corinthians would have glommed on to because they, that, that was very important to them. Somebody who was skilled in the art of rhetoric, getting up and making speeches and being persuasive, that was something that they viewed as a status symbol. And so it makes sense that they were maybe rattling around Apollos for that reason. So Apollos was involved in the, uh, the, uh, the early Corinthian church. And also we, we have here a mention of Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. Peter. That's just the uh, Greek transliteration of the Aramaic word for Peter, Cephas. It means uh, rock or stone. And so we don't know for sure if Peter ever actually came to this church or if it was just that people, some of the Jews maybe had heard of, of Peter being instrumental in the Jerusalem church and glommed on around that. But the scripture never tells us that Peter was actually uh, in uh, the city of Corinth. Uh, it's certainly possible, but uh, he's, uh, Cephas is mentioned four times in this epistle. Cephas, uh, his name was changed by Jesus himself from Simon. Read about that in John 1.42. And then also, I have Christ. Now, that, that kind of strikes us as odd. Well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't we want to be in the, in the I am of Christ pile if, if there's all these groups forming? There's two main views about what Paul is trying to say here. Number one, there may have been a Christ party in that they were only taking the teachings of Christ and rejecting anything the apostles or any other inspired man would have said. There are people that believe that today to an extent. We call them, you know, red letter believers. They'll believe anything that's in the red letters, but any other scripture, they say, well, that's just, that's not inspired. Well, that's just not true, because 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture or every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Apostles were inspired, and their authority was equal uh, to that of Jesus speaking himself. Jesus promised that. And so that, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that is Paul is saying, okay, you're saying you're a Paul. You're saying you're of Apollos. You're saying you're of Cephas. And he's breaking now and saying, I am of Christ. I'm of the Christ party. So there, there's one view that he's talking about himself. It's just not that clear from the text, and it's sort of a difficulty. And so, you know, study up on it, form your own opinion about it. We don't know for sure what the Christ party had to do here. But one thing for sure is that there was an issue of clashing egos and selfishness. And it wasn't revolving around theological faith issues. This is... Going, uh, going along with reputations of these people. And it's not as if Paul, Apollos, and Cephas were the ones creating the division. They were not. But we're going to find out here in the next uh, couple of verses uh, why it was possibly that they were following these men. And so in verse 13 it says, Is Christ divided? So he has, he has three rhetorical questions here. Is Christ divided? No. no obviously not. That, that answers itself. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Oh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. Just look at the next kind of preview to the next chapter. But uh, look at 2 2. And did somebody read that for us? For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's right. Jesus was the one that was crucified. That's all Paul claimed to know. He didn't come there with uh, fanciful speech, he came there just declaring the cross. And so. Uh, so, we're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 18-20. Christ alone is the source of redemption, not human leaders. Uh, I found a quote here uh, uh, from one of the uh, sources that I was studying, and it uh, says this. I thought it was particularly helpful to this verse. It says, The problem is not that the Corinthians failed to understand these truths, and that Paul needs to set them straight. The problem is that they have failed to live out the implications of their belief and a crucified Christ and their unity in him. The reason these are rhetorical questions is because these things were plainly known to these people. There was no question in the Corinthians' mind who it was that was crucified for them. There was no question in their mind who, uh, whose name they were baptized into. And the fact that Christ is one, he's not divided. That's, it, it's not that they didn't have the mental knowledge. We know that Paul was there for a year and a half teaching them. It was that they failed to live out the implications of that teaching. It's like, yeah, I know that, but hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to form a party around the person who baptized me, Apollos, uh, and I like him because of his speech, and in the, in the process, effectively, they didn't really believe the doctrines because they weren't living them out. It's one thing to mentally 
uh, men have mental assent to something that it being true. It's another thing to really start to mold our lives and to live out the implications of that truth, and that's something that they failed to do uh, in, uh, in the church of Corinth, at least at this point. Okay, verse 14, it says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Well, if we read that out of context, we said, what are you talking about, Paul? Wouldn't you want to baptize every soul that lived on earth during this time? <coughs> What's he saying? He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any, here's the reason, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. Paul is not downplaying the importance of baptism here. He's not. Paul preached, uh, read Romans chapter 6, verse, six verses there. Uh, Paul, Galatians 3, 27, he taught the necessity of baptism for salvation. What he's talking about is it's not as important who does the physical baptizing as it is what you're doing. And the reason he said he didn't want to have personally baptized more of them is because more of them would have rallied around him as sort of a, a, a creating division within the body. So we're told here that he baptized Crispus. Uh, Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue in Corinth, Acts 18.18. And Gaius was uh, Paul. <coughs> we're, just, we're introduced to a few different men named Gaius in Scripture. It's hard to tell if it's all referring to the same person or which particular ones refer to this Gaius, but... Uh, it might be the case that he was Paul's fellow traveler, uh, who was his host at Corinth. Romans 16.23 mentions Gaius as uh, being Paul's host when he wrote the Roman letter from Corinth. And so he was a brother. Uh, so these are people who were probably very early converts. In fact, uh, at the end of the book, we're going to learn that uh, Stephanus was one of the first groups. Uh, in other words, he was one of the first ones that Paul baptized. So he, he did baptize Crispus, Crispus and Gaius. But he didn't want, he's glad he didn't baptize more of them because more of them would have been divided because they would have followed Paul instead of following Christ. And in verse 16 it says, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. It's not as if Paul was putting notches in his Bible every time he baptized somebody. Uh, he's saying here that, look, I, you know, I don't remember if I baptized any more. It doesn't matter who did the baptizing, is what he's saying. Who does the physical act of baptism is not as important as what the individual is doing. Uh, Stephanus uh, was an early convert of Achaia. Uh, he was a recognized leader and faithful member of the church. Uh, if you look at the uh, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 15 through 17, you'll read about that. Uh, so Stephanus was a faithful brother. But the point is, Paul is, is, is emphasizing that it's not as important who does the baptizing as it is what you're doing. And the people apparently were rallying around men, perhaps the one that baptized them. You can picture this. You can picture, you know, uh, somebody who's a Corinthian, they, you know, they obey the gospel, and yet they still carry that baggage from the world into the church, and they say, wow, I was baptized by Apollos. Look what a great speaker he is. Remember that time where he let them have in the synagogue? I was baptized by Apollos. Who, who baptized you? Oh, 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 Cephas, or, or Paul. Oh, Paul, that little sickly-looking guy. Well, Apollos baptized me. You can see this happen, and that's what was going on, at least in part, was the reason for their division. Uh, they were putting more emphasis on the baptism because of their pagan background. This is where the background comes into play. That's why it's important we understand these people. It's because they may have viewed baptism like a magical rite. Like this was, you know, the, it was uh, sort of a, a magic act that was going on. And there was a lot of, you know, mysticism surrounding it. So who did the baptizing was very important. But Paul's telling you, no. Christ was the only one crucified for you. He's the only one whose name you should bear. Verse 17, the last verse in this context. For Christ sent me not to baptize preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, again, that same idea. He's not saying baptism is not important. You have to look at the whole corpus, the whole entirety of scripture to see what he says about baptism. But he's saying the point is, my commission as an apostle was to preach. I'm going to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel is one word in the Greek language. It means to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that was Paul's role. He was an apostle. He was gifted in teaching. Other people could baptize, but not everybody could do what Paul was doing as an apostle. He's saying, that, that's my work. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now this introduces us to a very important theme in the book of 1 Corinthians, this idea of worldly wisdom versus God's wisdom. And we'll get into that in more detail next week in the, in the rest of chapter 1. But this is sort of a prelude to that. This term wisdom shows up in the book of 1 Corinthians far more than any other book in the New Testament. 28 times in 1 Corinthians this term wisdom shows up. This is the type of wisdom that was manifested or shown in speeches, uh, the form of rhetoric over content. Again, this outward show of speech. They would 
uh, that they, for entertainment, they would go listen to a great speaker who was a very a great rhetorician, uh, uh, who was very skilled in the art of rhetoric. But yet, the content of the message, the truth of the message wasn't what was emphasized, it was how they sounded and, and how great the speech was. And so the speech was very pleasant. And that's what the Corinthians elevated. He's saying, I didn't come doing that. That's not what I came to do. I didn't come to impress you with my words. I didn't come to impress you with how flowery my talk sound. I came to proclaim to you the gospel. And if I would have preached to you that way, what? The cross of Christ would remain of none effect. That's important. That's a wake-up call to the 21st century in all the pulpits across this country. It's a serious thing to get into the pulpit, maybe refer to one scripture, and don't even <coughs> put it in its context and just give a flowery talk and make people feel good about themselves. That's sickening to me, and I hope it does you too. Because Paul is saying that would make the cross of Christ of none effect. Why? Because it subverts the persuasive power of the cross by substituting the, the, the pure and simple gospel, the only thing that has the power to save, with a human uh, rhetorical persuasion method. That doesn't mean that preachers don't, can't utilize persuasion, can't utilize certain uh, literary features and, and, and ways of speaking. That doesn't mean we have to make our sermons just boring. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, I didn't come to impress you with the outward form at the expense of uh, the doctrine. It also makes the cross of no effect because sophisticated rhetoric was tied to the educational value system. And the idea was, if he were to have preached that way, he would have been viewed as somebody in the higher echelons of society. And that would have hurt his ministry in Corinth, especially with the poor uh, element of uh, the, the population. And also, uh, it makes the cross of no effect because clever rhetoric is superficial. It appeals to emotions without digging into the spiritual depths. So a lot of people can get up and stir up people's emotions, but uh, we need to be able to, to stick with the Word of God, because that's what preachers are commissioned to. Uh, preach. And so, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses one, uh, 10 through 17, talk about the divisions that existed in the church. He first commands them to be of the same mind, the same judgment, to, uh, to restore the divisions that existed. Part of the reason they were divided is because they were rallying around certain uh, religious leaders in the Corinthian community. And Paul's saying, uh, that's nonsense. We're all, we're all in Christ. He's the one that was crucified for you. Uh, we need to be unified in him. So that's going to be a theme that uh, continues on through the rest of these, this epistle. All right, so let's look at our true and false questions, uh, beginning uh, with number one. And here, number one, it says, true or false? Paul told the Corinthians to be perfectly joined together. Good. True. What verse? One Okay, we looked at that. So they, uh, they were, in fact, commanded to do that. How about number two? True or false? Those who were of the household of Stephanus were the ones to alert, uh, to alert Paul of the problem of the contentions. False. Who was it? Uh, household of Chloe. Very good. Now we learned that from chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, number 3. True or false? Some of the Corinthians were claiming to be of Apollos. True. True. Okay. So that's in verse what? 12? 12. All right. Good. Number 4. True or false? Paul baptized Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus. Did he baptize any others? That's right. He did, he didn't remember. What's that? Only those were mentioned. We know those for sure, but uh, he could have baptized a few more, but uh, if he did, very few more than that. Uh, 114 and 116. And number five, the last true or false question. Uh, Paul preached with wisdom of words. False. False. Worldly wisdom, right? That's what he has in mind there. False, because he just said that in verse 17. And then in the next, in verses 18 through 31, the rest of this chapter, we're going to see the paradox, this contrast between God's wisdom and worldly wisdom, and how they're at odds, and they're irreconcilable. Very good. So let's get into our discussion questions with the time we have left. Uh, I guess that kind of came up into the heading. Uh, but uh, if you look at number six, under, under the discussion questions, it says, uh, Paul rebukes the Corinthians for being preacher followers instead of being Christ followers. Part A of that is what examples of division in Christianity do we see today because of the following, because of following men instead of Christ? And if you would like to speak, just please raise your hand, and that way uh, we can uh, kind of keep it on track. So if you have something to say, just raise your hand, and I'll call them. Mr. Eric? In today's uh, spiritual world, it's the popularity of preachers or popularity of men, commonly known as preacher writers. <laughs> That's the same thing they were having then. They were following men, I thought. Right. Very good. 
follow the messenger, not the messenger. Good. I, I thought about this big mega church that they have today. Uh, they're springing up all across the country. They got some flamboyant preacher gets on the TV and becomes. They, they follow him, and he writes a book or two, or three or four books. And it's all about him and my church. I thought about that, <coughs> thinking about this question. Good. Cult leaders. Oh, cult leaders? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm in the um, Christ Church, he, there'll be a minister that'll be there, and the elders decide that they're going to let him go for whatever reason that, that they choose to let him go. And sometimes, because he was so well liked or, or popular with some of the members, when he leaves, they leave also. And so that's a. Or they stay behind and make trouble. That's absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I think about the. Uh, my dad's been church uh, uh, I, I think about the denominational world. Uh, you know, who. All these names, and most of them are following men of some way down the line. I think about particularly uh, Luther. And the reason I bring up Luther is because we have a lot of quotes from Luther that where he openly condemns people following in his name. So here's what he said. Martin Luther, uh, founder of the Lutheran Church. We can say it that way. He said this. He said, what is Luther? The teaching is not mine. And of course, Luther taught some things that were very biblical and very true. I, I wouldn't agree with everything he taught, obviously, but he was living in a time where the Roman Catholic Church was extremely oppressive in its doctrine. And so he was, he was uh, reforming out of that. And here's what he said. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor sneaking bag of maggots, I apologize for the language is his, that I am, come to point out where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? He goes on to say, May God protect us against the preachers who please all the people and enjoy a good testimony from everybody. Martin Luther condemned people following after him in his name, and yet what do we see today? The Lutheran denomination. I don't know how many followers they have, but it's a large, large denomination. Where, where, how did that start? Following after a, a person, a man. And their allegiance to a man becomes uh, stronger than their allegiance to the Scripture and what uh, the Bible teaches. And so I see that denominational award, and also uh, it does. This does creep into the brotherhood. It does affect us. You know, I know what we say. I know what we mean when we say that we have a favorite preacher, and we like to hear certain certain brethren. And that's fine. We can have people we like to hear. They're good as fathers of the scripture. But I think you know that can be dangerous sometimes because it's sort of creating this mentality that you know we're following preachers. You know, if we hear of a gospel meeting going on somewhere, we go not to support the preacher. We go to support the gospel. It shouldn't matter who's preaching as long as they're faithfully teaching. We're going to support the gospel. We're not going to support uh, one preacher, even though we may like uh, certain preachers over others. All right? Very good. Good comments. Yes, Mr. Bill. You know, I, I think about the Apostle Paul. Today, people wouldn't hire him because he's a good speaker. Well, he's not married either, and he's not 35 yeah, you know, years old. Yeah. <laughs> look out. Look out. Look, look, look at the work he did. Yeah. Also, the, a lot of the churches nowadays, the denominational churches, they have men that started those churches in a lot of instances rather than uh, going back to the first church. And they, these men, uh, such as, I was a Methodist, so I, at one time I, I was baptized by sprinkling. Uh, the men that caused me to be sprinkled like that and not taught the true nature of baptism uh, wrote a letter to the churches in the United States in which he changed from uh, immersing to sprinkling and said that would be okay from then on. A man did that. On his word, look how many people have probably not gone to heaven because of that. It, it, it can be hard. Now, I'm not saying that to anybody's feelings. I, I was a good man. I was and uh, I, 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 would, I, would, I would never say that if I hadn't. But that, that's just one instance. You look at all the other denominational churches who are run by men rather than God's Word. 
we've already mentioned favorite preachers. However, there's two others that I don't think have been mentioned, and that would be following popular authors or magazine editors. And as a young preacher, I had to face some people in a congregation that had the big fat book by Brother So and So, and apparently I was being that was used as a measuring stick. And I protested that and said, you know, the only thing that I should be measured by is the Bible itself. And uh, but they, this one author, had a big following, and in one of his books. He alleged that a couple of different Bible versions did not uphold the virgin birth. So I got curious about that, and I said, this is a pretty serious charge. So I got those versions, and I looked them up, and they did uphold the virgin birth. And so it comes down to some of these people have their favorite things to believe and favorite things to say and they're able to attract a following due to their own style or their own preferences. And when brethren let other people do their thinking for them, that's that's where the real blame is because we got to have courage to read the New Testament, to look at Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith and let it be that. Right. Acts 17, 11, right? These were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so, whether those things were power. So, uh, so certainly uh, those are some great comments. Very quickly, uh, what are some things that Christians, I mean, we're, uh, oftentimes we're kind of, we're very, we, act, we operate out of reactions to problems. We're putting out fires instead of taking proactive steps to prevent some of these problems from happening. What are things that Christians, New Testament Christians today can do to promote unity and prevent this type of division? By teaching Christ. Yep. By teaching Christ. Teaching Christ. Okay, anybody else? Studying the Word. Studying the Word. Studying the Word, Mr. Bill? Well, a lot of these problems come up in the church because of spiritual immaturity. They did not... But they don't let people not as knowledgeable of the scripture as should be. And a lot of problems come up because of that. You know, can I add a statement to that? Make it quick, we're about to close up. We need to watch the tendency sometimes to elevate the spiritual immature. So that they get the idea that, you know, they're more than they really are. I'm not saying keep anybody down, but I'm just saying, you know, the, the way it goes in school these days is we're supposed to praise all these kids no matter what. Well, we we need to be real about our faith. Everybody gets to talk. Right. Well, uh, here's just some things that I can pop very quickly at and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, you know, obviously, we need to have our faces in the scriptures and our hearts and our minds in the scriptures as much as possible. Uh, and we need to be able to have common sense to reason. Isaiah, in Isaiah 1.18 says, uh, you know, let's, let's sit down and let's reason together. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 talks about the importance of uh, those who are faithful uh, to teach others. Commit the same things that you've heard unto those who are faithful. Uh, Revelation 22.19 talks about the destruction that comes from adding to or taking away from God's word. And of course, Romans 10, 17, the faith uh, comes from hearing the word of God. You know, if we're all going to the same book, we're reasoning out of reasoning it, we can understand it, we can come to the same conclusions. We might not agree about everything in the world. We don't have to, but matters of faith, where the scripture speaks, and, and we can know things, and we can reason with each other, we can have unity there. And also, it's not only knowing the word, that's a crucial component, but also building relationships with it's a lot harder to run somebody down who you, who you feel like you're close to. It's a lot easier to promote somebody and understand where somebody's coming from the better we know them and know their story, know their background, maybe why they are the way they are. That helps us. And we need to embody godly attitudes. And just uh, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. Uh, we, talk, we talked about some today in Philippians, uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, and Colossians 3, 13 through 15. So there's, there's an attitude part which comes from spiritual growth. 
also are growing in the knowledge of the Word of God. We can have that type of unity. Paul wouldn't demand something that wasn't possible, right? God doesn't say, uh, jump this high, we're only capable of jumping this high. That's not how it works. We're capable of doing these things, and we can do them uh, if we follow the Scriptures. So I wish we had more time to have gotten to the rest of these. I uh, hope that uh, this has been profitable for you today, and uh, hopefully uh, maybe you can discuss these, and maybe if you want to hang out a little afterward, uh, we can discuss these last two. Uh, but we'll go ahead and put a marker here, and we'll get into our discussion here. Thank you for your attention. Also, uh, real quick, uh, the handouts for next week are on the foyer table. If you picked one up on the way in, good. If not, that's where they are. So there's a stack of them back there. Mark your stone books for number 255 for a stone of meditation. So once you got that marked, turn to 180. 180.
we're studying the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 through 17. And we talked a lot tonight about unity within the body of Christ, the things that promote unity. One of the things was attitude. Another thing was, was the doctrine, make sure we uh, were following uh, those things that are written. And we talked uh, about the condemnation that Paul had for the disunity that existed because of the quarreling that the brethren had over superficial matters. And there's no room for that in the church of our Lord. And so uh, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the text anymore, but just want to get us thinking about what are we doing personally to promote unity in the body of Christ, personally, here at the local congregational level and in the brotherhood at large. Am I doing more things to help promote unity, or am I doing things to destroy unity? I know that on the judgment day, whenever that happens, I, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that I'll, uh, of course we all, I'm going to have to beg for forgiveness and say, Lord, I, I know I, I could have done something more here, uh, and, and I'm going to just have to trust God's grace on that. But one thing I do not want to have to be said of me on the judgment day is that I created division within his precious body that he gave for us. That's one thing I never want to be guilty of, is, uh, neither will I be guilty of any other sin, but that's one thing that seems to occur over and over again in the New Testament. So let us all ask ourselves, what are we doing to promote unity? What are we doing? If we're doing things to promote unity, that's great. If not, let's continue in that. Let's, let's improve in that area. Let's help build relationships with each other. Let's study the Bible more. Let's have more Bible discussions. That promotes unity. And if we're not, if we're doing something to destroy unity, whatever that might be, we need to stop. And if it's something that's personal, we need to repent of that personally, ask God for forgiveness. And if it's something that's known among the congregation, that needs to be made right. It needs to be made right. Because we can't be restored and go forward whole, like Paul's talking about, unless that happens. So if you're in a condition tonight where you need to respond to the gospel, if you have not <coughs> never obeyed the gospel of Christ, it's very clear. You have to hear the gospel that produces faith, Romans 10, 17. Upon that belief, we repent of our sins, a change of mind that's brought about by godly sorrow results in a change of lifestyle. That brings us forward to confession, confessing Christ before men, and then we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And Christ washes away our sins at that point, Acts 2.38, and we're added to his body, Galatians 3.27. If we've done that, if we have not been the type of Christian, the person who's to be promoting unity and building up the body that we need to be, you can make that right tonight. If you have any need, let me know. Together we stand in sin. I am resolved, O Lord, to be charmed by the world's desire. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have over my side. I will hasten to him.